it's easy to find sort of basic songwriting advice. So things like uh, how do I write lyrics or how do I start thinking about writing lyrics. Um, it's easy to find music theory resources and books online, whatever. There's sort of this basic level of songwriting, which um, I think there's a lot of material that's available uh, for the person who wants to look for it. Um, that's not to say that songwriting is easy or that if you read these things, suddenly you'll be able to write uh, great songs or good songs or songs that you like or whatever you're trying to do with them. In my experience, um, that takes hours and hours and years and years uh, to develop your own voice and develop uh, the craft of songwriting and to develop a way to really put yourself into your songs, uh, which I think is a big part of music, the, the art of the singer-songwriter and art in general is not just learning the craft, but learning how to put what's unique about you into your material. Um, that's all stuff that I think just honestly takes years and years of, of hard work. Uh, what I thought would be more interesting, um, well, both for myself, but assuming also for any of you who see this, uh, would be to try to talk about how the process works for me. I don't think any two artists are the same in terms of the way they approach things, and I think advice can be helpful, um, but I know that for myself, whenever I hear something I like, if I hear a song that I like or I admire, what I immediately uh, want to know is how did the person go about that? Very specifically, very individually, very uniquely to them, what was their process? What came first? Was it lyrics? Was it music? What set off a particular thought? What set off a particular line? Um, because uh, again, just to, to reiterate, I do think the basics of, and lots of great ideas about how you can start writing songs and so on it's out there. Um, what to me is always incredibly mysterious is an individual songwriter's uh, process. So I'm gonna try to get you a little bit inside of mine in the hopes that that can illuminate something for, for you. Um, I know that for me, uh, whatever, whenever I've been able to learn very specifically about how somebody went about something, it's been really helpful for me. So I'm gonna try to do the same with this song. Uh, for you, and I, I hope it helps. I was a flower And I was a petal
So first of all, the title, um, every song pretty much has a title as far as I know. This is called I Was. Um, and in this case, uh, you know, some people write lyrics first, uh, as I was saying, some people write music first, sometimes they come together. Um, for me, in this case, the music actually came first. Um, so the, where the music came from here, and uh, I think this is something that happens more often than people might admit in a way, um, but the music here came from a, a picking exercise that I was just running through almost without thinking at all. Um, you know, if you're a player, you're constantly running scales, you're constantly building your technique. One thing as someone who loves finger picking, I'm always trying to find new patterns, new finger picking patterns, you know, sort of based on, this one is sort of based on old kind of almost folk revival 1960s stuff, which reinterpreted a bunch of earlier kind of folk styles of guitar playing, the Travis picking, um, which is a great one to learn, which which has this great sort of alternate bass thing with the thumb, something I learned years ago and have uh, used a lot of a lot of different times in a lot of different ways. But so I'm always thinking, how can I sort of reinterpret or um, reimagine uh, finger picking? Uh, because it's something I love the sound of. It's been done a lot. What can I do? So this was just a pattern that sort of by rote, I found myself doing uh, just playing for myself on the couch one day. And I was doing it and just spacing out as I usually am when I'm playing. And I was thinking, you know, this has a really nice quality to it. It reminds me of water. That was sort of the visual I had in my head. And water, it's kind of a cliche, but I also was thinking, you know, there's something about time passing. It's kind of that classic waterfall coming down and reflective mood and time is passing. Somehow these cliches, um, which I guess still have meaning for me somehow, um, these were all sort of bouncing around very abstractly in my head. So, so there was my first chord, just sort of spacing out on this, you know, C, I mean, in theoretical terms, just in the first C major chord you learn on a guitar, kind of major triad root position. Uh, and I thought, oh, where can that go? Um, part of what I was getting from the pattern and what I was talking about with kind of this water image, this time passing, is that something changes, but something also stays the same. Uh, this may sound sort of abstract, but this is uh, this is something uh, compositionally that I think people do all the time, um, not just in pop, rock, folk music, but you know, classical everything, right? So you're you're keeping something constant, but you're also uh, changing something musically. So this is just just dealing with the music of the song. So. So that was the second chord that just my fingers sort of fell to it. It's not an uncommon chord, it's an F major seven, but I keep the C in the bass. So that's sort of like the drone. So there's something to me that I was thinking, time, again, water, uh, there's this constant, and there it is. And so in, this, in these chords too, you've got uh, the lowest note, which is the C remaining constant, and also the E on top is also remaining constant because it's an F major seventh with the C in the bass. So to me, something about that um, was very symmetrical. So I started kind of, at this point, humming a little bit melodically what might happen during the verse. Uh, almost a sort of, I had an idea, this is the way it often works for me, kind of had an idea for the feeling of it, um, more than specific lyrics. But again, I had this image of time in my head and I think I, so I started saying I was. I was. Didn't have specifics, um, but 
uh, realized at that point that I should probably record it. Probably the most important thing about songwriting or writing songs, uh, in my opinion, in my experience, is actually recording uh, what the ideas that you come up with. This is so obvious, but you need to have something in place so that when an idea strikes, you can get it down. Uh, life takes over, you'll forget about it. You need to have something in place. For me, I have a, a Pro Tools rig um, at my house. I sometimes use GarageBand if I don't have any time to even set that up. Uh, I can't stress enough how important for me that's been. Um, if I have any idea, musically, lyrically, to get that down without prejudging it, without sort of doing editing in your head, uh, to me, that's those are your rough drafts that you can work with later. So that was very much the case with this. Um, what I did was went over to Pro Tools, uh, put a microphone up, and uh, got this pattern. And these lyrics. I was, uh, right? I, so I didn't, I had, didn't know where I was going with it. I liked the idea of I was. Okay, so that was, that was the beginning of this song. Um, I got that much down. Uh, life took over, did something else, came back to it a few days later. Um, I liked it. Uh, so what I often do, this is just my process, I'll listen to musical ideas that I have, also with a Word document open on the computer, um, or a notebook, whatever, doesn't matter, whatever works best for you. Um, but I start to jot ideas, often very abstract. You know, this one came quickly. I didn't think it would need that many words. I, in a way, I didn't want it to be too wordy. I didn't want that to detract from, uh, from the music and from the message, which it was becoming more clear to me that I wanted it to be pretty abstract, um, but to get something across about time moving or about aging. Um, that's something I think we all think about a, a lot as we get a little bit older. So um, I didn't want it to be too literal. I knew I wanted it to be abstract. Again, to take a step out, I think that's a really important decision that any songwriter has to make. You're balancing, you don't, you know, something that's completely abstract uh, may be beautiful, but there may not be enough to hold on to. Something that's completely literal without any sort of metaphor or any sort of literary devices um, can just seem really square. To me, it's not that interesting to go that direction, though that works for some people and you know, for some pop songs and so on, that can be great. Um, if you're just saying exactly what you feel. But I think for the type of song that I'm more interested in, which is a little bit more intellectual, hopefully, and a little bit more, um, you know, artistic, I guess, in a certain way, in terms of its composition, I think there's got to be a balance of the abstract and the literal. So this case, I was thinking, you know, uh, this should be more abstract, on the more abstract side. So I was, um, I was playing around, so what, I was thinking, I was what? What was I? Um, I was saying I was a rose. And I think I had that in another song of mine from years ago. And I thought I can't reuse that. And in a way, that's actually even too specific. So I thought if I just say I, I was a flower. I was a flower. I mean, a flower is so generic in a way. And that's what I mean about there's something with that where the listener can apply wherever they're coming from and whatever they're going through onto that. If something's super literal, that gets very hard to do that in the same sort of way. When something is more abstract, again, for better and worse, I'm not saying one is better than the other. It depends on what you want a song to get across. But um, in, you know, for me, uh, when something is more abstract, you can really, uh, in a way, space out on the song and kind of take it wherever you want to take it. We're kind of here in the first verse, right? So, I was a flower. Then I was a petal. Uh, why not repeat it? Keeps it really simple. I was a flower. Now here, I was feeling like there needed to be a change musically and lyrically. So um, 
you know, in terms of the theory of this, this is the relative minor, uh, which is just always pretty. We've heard it in 75 million songs. Uh, and it seems so unkind. No one pays me. All right, so a couple things that happened there. Um, again, uh, classic chord progression, A minor, G, F, you know, Stairway to Heaven and 500,000 other songs. I did the same thing here, which is that I left the high E string uh, ringing out, which I think gives it some sense of continuity. Uh, again, back to that kind of musically trying to mirror what's going on lyrically and vice versa. Um, I think that's incredibly important no matter what type of song you are uh, writing or performing or singing, whatever, is to have some sort of uh, connection between lyrics and music. And it can be really subtle and it can be really abstract. And if you're good, hopefully it is those things, um, you know, unless it's a pop song, which is not meant to be particularly subtle or abstract most of the time, but that's a different thing. Um, but I think there can be something really important in somehow trying to marry the feel of the music uh, to the lyrics. Um, so that's what I was trying to do, you know, whether I was successful or not, who knows. But again, I'm, this is just my process. Seems so unkind. Lyrically, to me, these are very melancholy chords. I mean, a, a sixth chord to me is super melancholy. And the major seventh after it. No one paid me no mind. You know, the image I had in my head was someone getting older and time's just kind of passing and no one's really paying attention and no one seems to give it. You know, that's something I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, anyway, that's where I was coming from. Uh, and then I, next, uh, there's a little instrumental break in the song. So, um, so here I seem so unkind. No one pays me no mind. Kept this going a little longer than I might. I was. So I don't know if you can, you know, see what I'm doing or pick that up, but I'm keeping the same chords as in the verse, but I'm changing the bass note. So instead of a C major triad root position, I put the G in the bass, put the fifth in the bass. That would be called, you know, to me that's called variation on a theme. I have my musical theme. Uh, I've already kind of set it out. It's in the listener's head. Um, here comes a little break. What can I do to just slightly tweak that theme, to slightly change it enough so that it remains interesting? It's familiar. You're coming kind of back home. Uh, but at the same time, there's something about it that's different or speaks to you in a different way. So these were the chords I chose for that. A C over G. Then this low F, which was not in the other chord that I was playing in the verses. And then a C over a G, and then an F major 7th over an A, which is a very sort of undefined chord. Um, you know, in theor theoretical terms, it's the third of the chord uh, in the root, but with the open E on top, it kind of sounds like a minor chord, kind of sounds like a major 7th chord. You don't know what it is. Anyway, I wanted it to fit in again, lyrically, uh, very sort of abstract and melancholy. So there it was. I liked what I had. I wanted to keep sort of the same feeling going. Uh, I was a foul. So I like the word foul for a couple of reasons. Um, one is it played off a of flower in the first verse, um, just sort of poetically or lyrically. Uh, that was something I thought um, people might not notice or pick up on, but those are the subtleties that I'm, as a writer, I'm trying to get to and hoping that it comes across in some way. 
Uh, also, foul you know, has several meanings, um, and I like both of them in a way, and I like the listener not knowing there's foul, F-O-W-L, like a bird, like a chicken or whatever, and there's foul like a foul ball, uh, and I'm a, I'm a baseball fan, so that is something I liked. I like the idea of someone calling themselves a foul ball, uh, something about that seemed poetic to me, so I was a foul... a feather. So there it kind of becomes clear. I had to make a choice lyrically. Am I going the foul ball direction or going the chicken direction? I decided to go the chicken direction. Not sure why. Um, but I guess it, it tied into the, the first verse to flower to petal and then a foul to a feather, sort of this de-evolution or something. I'm not sure. Um, but then I kept that going. Again, I was a foul. A feather. So I repeated it again, keeping it super simple. And I'm getting at. And it seems so sublime. Slight lyric change. I unwind. And then here, I felt like I needed something new. A casualty. This, just musically. I mean, that's been used in lots of songs too. It's a classic Paul Simon, among others, um, something he'll throw in. Casualty of time. Time's just passing. Again, variation on a theme. Um, any songwriter, I think, needs to be clued into this, from pop to folk to classical to whatever. Um, this, to me, is a key component of any good songwriting or composition, is that you're aware of what you're presenting to your listener, kind of thematically. So here's the C. The C chord is throughout this song by making it a C major seventh chord. I'm tweaking it just a little bit. It's that melancholy of a major seventh chord. Um, it's, again, you're back home because you're kind of on a C chord and you're back on bass in a certain way, but there's just enough change that you hopefully pay attention. This chord uh, just sort of stumbled upon, I mean, in, in theoretical terms, it's the F major 7 plus the sharp 11. Uh, it's got a B natural, but it's just, it kind of doesn't matter what you call it. Um, it has a, it has a great rub in the chord. You know, there's a dissonance to it. There's that tritone. Anyway, I thought that that sort of could set off the listener in some different direction. So it's kind of, it's back home, it's on this bass but it's also dissonant and, you know, endings of songs, super important, you know, almost as important as how they start probably. Um, how do you, it's the last impression that the listener is left with. So how do you want them to kind of walk away from the song feeling, right? Do you want them feeling, you know, oh, okay, it's all tied up in a bow. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I knew for me, for this song, I would want to leave it very much hanging because to me that's, on some poetic level, that's sort of the nature of time passing and, you know, things unfolding and, um, you know, it's very bittersweet. It's very melancholy, even on a totally abstract level, not talking any specifics about my life or anybody else's life. Um, those were the sorts of themes I had in mind for this song. So these chords, to me, uh, an ending on ending on that major seventh uh, on a really hanging chord. Uh, that to me ended the tune 
um, in the way that I wanted and that I was thinking about, which is leaving the listener in a way hanging and in a way there being kind of a question mark at the end of a song as opposed to like in pop songs, it's always an exclamation point, sometimes a period or whatever, so to speak. You know what it is. It's a major chord. It's a minor chord. It's this. It's done. I wanted this to be much more abstract. That's the nature of this tune. It was an abstract kind of arty folk tune. Um, hopefully it worked. You know, it's very subjective. I'm sure it works for some people more than other people. But um, I hope that this uh, glimpse sort of inside my process can help on some level. You know, the questions multiply. They just get more infinite. So, for example, when you're starting out writing songs, uh, I think you are very concerned with the basics, such as how do I write a lyric? Or, or what comes first, music or lyrics? Or, um, you know, how do I structure a verse? How do I structure a chorus? You know, the sort of the basic questions of, of songwriting. Um, when you start out, I mean... The same as with any art form, naturally you have to start from the simplest sorts of questions. So that stuff is incredibly important and stuff that I grapple with every day when I, when I write. Um, but what I hope that this did or does a little bit is uh, to give a little glimpse sort of beyond that. I've been writing songs for um, a long time, decades. Uh, you know, I started when I was a kid, uh, and and those were the questions that I thought about then. I still think about them now, but now on top of that, there are all of these other sorts of questions, which I think, I mean, maybe I'm fooling myself, at least I tell myself they're a little bit more subtle. Um, so those are questions of mood, of themes, of repeating themes, of altering themes, of, again, abstract versus literal, you know, to what it what sorts of metaphors to use, um, and and musically, how can I um, how can I create a sort of ambience or an environment musically that matches what I'm trying to do lyrically, and vice versa, because you cannot separate them. Uh, when someone hears a song, um, they don't just hear a word abstracted out of time; they hear the whole thing. So they're hearing the word or the lyrics and the music at the same time, which it needs to be married. It needs to be one effect. Um, I mean, it is whether you like it or not. So you might as well really put a lot of thought into it um, and thinking about what you want to get across. Um, so those are some of the questions uh, that I was dealing with in this song specifically. Different songs, it's really different. Um, if I'm writing something that's more pop, it will probably tend to be less abstract. Um, if I'm writing something that is purely for me and I don't care at all how other people take it on, then I'm not going to worry about a lot of things. It, will, it could be stream of consciousness and something great could come from that. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, sort of the overall context is, is super, super important. So um, really thinking about the effect that you want to get across and using everything within your power to create that effect is what a songwriter does, I think, what a composer does. Um, and that includes, and this is kind of the whole point of this, that includes all sorts of questions that are not addressed um, as simply as uh, what, um, you know, how do I write a verse? Uh, does a chorus repeat once or twice or three times? I think those are incredibly important questions, um, but without some more context for it and more sense of what you're trying to do, um, they're not not as important, I think, as, as a lot of people make them out to be. Um, I think a lot of that stuff is much more variable than... Um, than is often taught or than a lot of people who are teaching songwriting or talking about songwriting. Uh, it's, it's a lot more variable and really depends on what you're trying to get across. What I was just talking about, that way of composing, uh, is in a way it's super old school. Um, it's sort of talking about simply putting pen to paper, so to speak, playing the instrument, 
coming up with lyrical ideas. Um, that's what I'm discussing. In pop music today, uh, the way that production often happens, or the way that composition happens, is through production. There's, there's no difference between the two. If you listen to anything uh, kind of top 40 pop, Rihanna or whatever, um, those songs, maybe there was an initial lyrical idea or um, somebody had an idea for a chord progression. Usually it's just one cycling over and over or a drum beat or something. Uh, but more often than not, those songs are composed basically entirely in the studio. Um, so what I'm talking about or have been talking about today um, so far is something different. This is sort of old school composition. Um, that being said, there is another marriage that takes place no matter what, um, which is between uh, the song itself, again, whatever you've sort of written, uh, and the production. Um, this is incredibly important. Uh, think of any song that is... Uh, a song that you like, a uh, favorite song, and it's all of a piece. It's all one thing. You cannot separate out, just like you can't separate out lyrics from the music, really, because it's all one thing, neither can you separate those things out from the production, from the band, from the orchestration, from the instrumentation, um, from the sounds of each, each instrument from the overall envir sound environment that you create. So in terms of the production of my song, I Was, right? This is, um, before I even got to thinking about production, I already had a certain mood established. Melancholy, abstract, it's not a pop song. It's, I don't know what it is, a folk song, uh, an art song, something indie sounding. It doesn't really matter what you call it. But I clearly had some direction um, that I was already going, right? So um, when it got to actually recording the song, uh, this was something that I was thinking about, of course, is, okay, so what instruments will really bring out these feelings in the way I want them to? What sort of orchestration? etc uh, etc etc et so um this is the general way i thought um is okay melancholy sort of abstract what are some instruments that add to that um, i'm a big fan of strings in uh in rock or folk music if especially if they're not overdone so uh, i especially love the cello uh and long lines on the cello to me are very beautiful and also have that sort of Strings have that real watery sort of time elapsing feel that I was going for. Um, so for this tune, actually, uh, we got a great cellist, Elisa Horn, and um, her friend Coco, who plays viola and violin. I think she just, she just played um, viola on this, and they put some beautiful um, harmonies and basically long notes on top of, especially some of the instrumental sections, which I thought really um, sort of exaggerated in a good way some of those melan melancholic aspects of the song. So um, that's one way I was thinking. Uh, and then in the studio, uh, when recording this, the drummer Meyerhorn um, had an idea for a drum beat. Uh, just very simple. It wasn't something that I was thinking of, but this is part of the creative process. So in the studio, uh, all sorts of things can happen. You can, you know, they, it can be for better or worse. In this case, Meyer put down a really straight drum beat, as you can hear in the finished product. Um, and I thought that it really actually opened it up and kind of the metrical kind of provided some really nice markers in a way um, where I, I, that I thought would actually give people a little something more to hold on to. Um, just finger picking, I think, in this day and age, it's hard for a lot of people to stick with it um, in this age of whatever, ADD and, uh, and all of that. Um, I think something about having a beat, a simple beat, kind of marking out the two and the four, it uh, kept, for me, it, it sort of helped keep the listener's attention, or at least I hope it does. But because it was such a simple beat, it didn't really get in the way of the finger picking or of these long string lines, it just sort of provided markers. Um, 
you know, so those are some of the things I was thinking of. The last element that's on this uh, is a piano. And, um, you know, I, I grew up playing piano. I love piano. Um, but I think piano in rock music is, unless you're Elton John or Billy Joel or a few other people, it's often best sort of as an atmospheric agent. So, you know, the way I was thinking of it here was just some really nice harmonies that, again, sort of provide a new element if that's needed um, and and kind of help bring out some of the melancholy aspects. So, um, you know, I chose some harmonies for this. I think that the main harmony I'm using um, is a tenth, you know, which is it's kind of famous. It's like the harmony from Blackbird, Paul McCartney tune, um, used all the time in lots of songs. It's just very, to me, just a very beautiful and, and melancholy kind of harmony. So, you know, I added that on the piano as well in a few very simple lines, as you can hear in the finished product. Um, hopefully, all of these things together um, create some sort of effect that I was hoping or, you know, maybe something is slightly different, but hopefully something that's effective. Thank you. 